Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you turn me down just a little bit? Keep your Bibles open to Matthew 13. This is a parable that we're probably all familiar with. The Pearl of Great Price. In two verses, Jesus gives such a depth of meaning in this story. We can read this, and I, in, in preparing for this, read many, many different commentaries on the Pearl of Great Price. <coughs> Saw a lot of different ideas uh, of what this parable actually means, but as usual, I usually go back to the spirit of prophecy. And in the spirit of prophecy, what I find is a balanced uh, understanding of Jesus' parable. And in the book, Christ's Object Lessons, she goes through this parable. And the funny thing is, is when I was reading some other writers and their commentaries, they were saying it was either one way or the other what Jesus was talking about, who the pearl was, who the merchant was, and uh, what it meant to actually purchase it. Uh, but in Christ's Object Lessons, she gives you a very balanced uh, description of what all these terms mean. And she says that there's actually two meanings of this, and that's what we want to look at this morning. So again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, as Ray read, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. <coughs> the pearl in this, what do you think that pearl means? What is it a description of? Okay, Jesus, that's good. That's what a lot of commentaries state and say. Now think about it. A pearl. See, to the Jewish people, they really didn't care for pearls. It wasn't something that really, as a gem, pearls didn't really interest them. But to other royalty in the other nations, pearls were of great importance. This is how God works. Because Palestine was a gateway to that part of the world. And if you wanted to trade and do business there, everything came through Palestine. So when they saw pearls, they knew what they were. And it's funny that Jesus uses this description because, like I said, the, the Israelites didn't really care for pearls. But Jesus had a bigger audience that he was wanting to um, talk to and get them to understand what this meant. Plus, he wanted to teach his disciples and the Israelites a lesson. This pearl, think about it. A perfect pearl is without spot and without blemish, right? Jesus is without spot and without blemish. But the pearl can actually represent his redeeming love and his righteousness. Think about this. What Christ has done for you and I in giving of himself is perfect, it is pure, and it is without spot or stain. Now, as you go through your day-to-day -day life and you live in a world that's full of darkness and there are stains everywhere, continue to look to Jesus because it is Jesus and his righteousness that allows us to get through whatever this world throws at us. Amen. And whatever situation we find ourselves in. Is that right? Jesus' perfection, his beauty, his love is matchless. And this is what he offers you and I. The pearl of great price. Right? Jesus is that pearl. What he offers us is his redeeming love. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verses 3 through 9. <coughs> Actually, I think it's going to be verses 3 and 9. The pages are sticking together. Colossians chapter 2. 
verse 3, it says, In whom are hidden, what? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Listen, this is part of this pearl. Jesus Christ, in Him is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Skip down to verse 9. For in Him dwells what? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Do you understand what that actually means? Amen. Because brothers and sisters today in the Adventist church, this is something that if you haven't heard, you will hear. And it is a controversy of the Godhead. Or as other uh, churches call the Trinity. Okay? The Bible gives you the description of the Godhead. And that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are they all God? Yes. Is that what the Bible teaches? Yes. Okay. What you need to realize is that in Jesus Christ, that before He came to this earth to be born a man, He was verily God. The Bible tells you in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 and on, in the beginning was what? The Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And you know this Word is Jesus Christ, because if you skip down a few verses, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Understand who Jesus Christ really is. When you start to grasp that Jesus Christ is fully God, and that the Father gave Him to us out of love, the only motivation and reason that the Father gave us His Son is because of the depth of His love for you and I. Now, do you think that was an easy decision for the Father to make? Again, if you go back to the Spirit of Prophecy, we're told that they went into council and that the Father and the Son came together. And if you read this account later on, towards the end of Ellen White's life, she also includes the Holy Spirit in there. So all three. We're in this council that if man chose to sin, when Adam sinned, did that take God by surprise? No. Do you understand what it means when the Bible tells you in Revelation that Jesus is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the earth? That means that none of this took God by surprise. That when Adam sinned, when Eve sinned, God already had a plan in place to take care of that sin. Don't you love the God that we serve? Amen. Listen, did God warn them what the wages of sin would be? Yes. Did God not tell them plainly? Do not eat of this tree, because in the day you eat thereof, you shall what? Die. Surely die. And yet God had a plan that if they did, and when they did, the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world was there to redeem them. Yes. Only one amen on that? Yeah. Come on now. Listen, are you awake? Are you here? Yeah. Do you love Jesus Christ? Yeah. Yes. If this doesn't actually touch your heart some way, somehow, <coughs> and you've been in church too long, and that's all you've been doing is church, Ooh. right? Either you understand who Christ is, and you grasp this in new light every day that you walk with Him, or it's just going to become old stuff, and you're going to go, okay, what's next? Right? Again, do you think it was easy for the Father to give His Son? Not at all. Do you understand when He gave His Son that they realized there was going to be a separation within the Godhead that never took place from eternity past? And when God, who's able to see and live in eternity past, eternity present, and eternity future all at the same time. He didn't have to wait to know what that separation was going to feel like. Oh, no. yeah. When he gave his son, they went into council. It wasn't like Jesus had to go in there and beg the Father, please let me save them. What he had to go into council for is the Father wanted to save us, but he also did not want to give up his son. Yeah. Understand that. That was a battle that God the Father had to fight and deal with. It's also a battle the Holy Spirit had to fight and deal with. Can you imagine the closest relationship that you've ever had and ever experienced? 
Jared, you got a baby in your arms right now, right? I think you love that baby, right? Just a little bit, right? <laughs> Could you fathom being separated from that child? That is what God was willing to do for us in the depths and darkness of our sin. The love that he had saw the worst that you would ever do. And that worst put Jesus Christ on the cross. But think about this. You know those little sins that we don't even think about? The little ones? That one little sin put Jesus Christ on the cross. Because the wages of sin is death. When you start to fathom the love that God has for us, and you start to understand what it meant for Him to sacrifice His Son, what it meant for Jesus to sacrifice Himself, then you start to grasp and understand this pearl of great price. <laughs> Listen, this pearl of great price, to the world, it's foolishness, it's weakness, and it's common. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look at verses 23 to 30. Actually, I'm going to read verse 22 first. Paul writes, For the Jews seek a sign, and the Greeks they seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews it's a stumbling block, and to the Greeks it's just stupidity. Your Bible may have foolishness. Think about that. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than any man. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things, the things that are not noble, in the sight of Jews and Greeks, these are the things that God has chosen. The things which are not to bring nothing the things that are, or to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us what? Wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now, look at that word, wisdom. You blow over that word and say, I have no idea what that actually means. What does that word, wisdom, mean that we receive from Christ? Paul starts this off by saying that the Jews seek a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. What's the difference between the wisdom the Greeks were searching after for and the wisdom that comes from Christ? Any ideas? You guys are quiet this morning. Have you read your Bibles today? Yesterday? The day before? Think about this. The wisdom that the Greeks were looking for was philosophical wisdom. Earthly wisdom. Wisdom that comes from men. God says, my wisdom to them is foolishness. But what you need to understand is that their wisdom to me is foolishness. And is useless. And will gain you nothing. Think about this. Think about this. Because we today seek after that wisdom. Even though we call ourselves Christians. We seek after it through education. We seek after it through reading books, watching movies, or whatever. There's a thousand ways to seek after the wisdom of this world. But I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, the profit <coughs> in that is very small when you come to the end of your life. Amen. Or it's very small if you walk out here and have a tragic accident happen to you. You're going to realize just <coughs> how small that wisdom is. But what Christ gives in the wisdom that he offers is wisdom that comes from the creator of heaven and earth. Amen. Now who do you think is smarter? <laughs> Men who write books 
for the God who made the men that were <laughs> What wisdom do you want to seek out? This is the pearl of great price. I'm 57, and I have seen the kids that I've grown up with become adults, have kids of their own. They have had kids of their own as well. And I've seen those who searched after the wisdom of this world. And at this stage in their life, I've seen it leave them empty. Empty. I've seen those who became rich in the world's goods, but inside they are poor and they're wretched and they're poor. And they're seeking to fill a hole that this world can never fill. Right? Because as the saying goes, it's a God-shaped hole, and the only one that's going to fill that is God himself. Right? I've seen those who've given their hearts to Jesus Christ, and in this world, they're poor. <laughs> but what they have in Christ, they are rich. They're happy. They're content. They have peace. And they have a joy that this world cannot give, nor does it understand. What do you want? When you leave here today, what do you want? You want the things that are out there in this world? Satan has a billion things to get your attention. <coughs> That's one. And that one thing is Jesus Christ. The pearl of great price. Let's look further at this two-verse parable. Jesus is the pearl. The righteousness of Christ is pure. It has no defect. It has no stain. The righteousness of Christ is without flaw. In Christ is hidden all the treasure and the wisdom of heaven. But listen, God wants to give you that treasure and that wisdom. Now, if you were to go to the richest person you know, knock on their door and say, Dude, can you give me your treasure? You think they'll give it to you? We don't knock on God's door. It is God who actually knocks on ours. Right? And He's wanting you to open it up because He's got an endless, eternal treasure. And all He's asking for you to do is open the door of your heart and let Him come inside. Know what the pearl of great price is. Amen. There you go. <laughs> this pearl is worth everything. It's worth everything we have. It's worth everything we are. And it's worth everything we ever hope to be. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And let's look real quickly at verses 7 through 9. Again, this is Paul writing. The background of Paul, what was he before he gave his heart to Jesus Christ? Was he a Pharisee? Yes. Were Pharisees usually rich or poor? They were a lot. This is very important before we read this text. You need to understand what Paul's life was like before he got knocked off his donkey. I in Sabbath school today, too. Really? Think about this. Because when Paul tells you what we're going to read in this verse, you need to understand what Paul gave up. Paul sacrificed everything. And he tells you what he thought, what he thought about everything. When it came to Christ, or when it came to what he had before, he tells you what he had before, what it really was. Okay, and we're going to read that now. So Philippians, chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted lost for Christ. Now listen, you could not be a Pharisee unless you were well off. Because the Pharisees looked down on the poor that they were cursed by God. So again, if you weren't cursed by God, then you had all of this world's goods. You were rich. Pharisees were rich, right? Paul had all that, and Paul lost all that for Jesus Christ. Did he go, man, dude, I used to be rich. You wouldn't believe the house I lived in. You wouldn't believe the car I used to drive. What does he say? But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost.
for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Here you go. And count them as what? I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Brothers and sisters, that is the pearl of great price. The pearl of great price isn't the things of this world. The pearl of great price is the righteousness that comes from God in Christ through faith. Amen. Paul had to unlearn a lifetime of learning, sitting underneath the feet of great teachers who he had great respect for, but who trusted the truth of God's word. But let me ask you a question. Was Paul sincere in his heart? Absolutely. The whole, his whole life, even when he was persecuting Christians with zeal, he, <coughs> he thought, because that's what he was taught, that that was the right way. But when he encountered Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and light was shown him, did he go, no, can't accept it, uh, maybe next week, or I'll give this a thought, I'll get back with you. What did he do? The moment he saw who Christ was, and he asked that question, Lord, who are you? And Jesus answered him, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. You remember what Jesus said after that? It's hard to kick against the goats. Or in King James, the hard to kick against the pricks, right? Do you think God was working on Paul's heart? From day one. Right. Do you understand in the life of Paul, in the story of the Pearl of Great Price, God can take all of us, no matter what our background was, no matter what our background is today, and He can use us for the glory of His kingdom. I said this before, if you knew me, the difference is how many years is going to if you knew me 40 years ago, you would have never, ever, ever would have entertained the thought of me doing what I'm doing today. You would actually have held your purse closer to you, locked the keys to your car, <coughs> held them close, locked your car, locked your home. That's what you would have done. But God had different plans, right? Same thing with Paul. And when Paul encountered Jesus, Paul understood right then what the pearl of great price was. Paul, before this time, had the pedigree that put him in the upper echelons of the Pharisees. And he realized that that meant nothing. It was dumb to him. Because he understood that there is no righteousness that will ever produce. There is no pedigree that we'll ever have that will allow us to say to God, I deserve to be here. I've done all this for you. You need to let me in. Paul understood that what we need is a righteousness, and that righteousness can only come from God. Amen. And God's plan was the pearl of great price. That righteousness comes from Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen? Amen? Wow, so that's two amens. <coughs> Seriously, do you not grasp this? Because this is why you come to church. This is the only reason why we worship Christ. Because without Him, we are lost. Do you understand that? Amen. When you start to see this, and you start to grasp the matchless charms of Jesus Christ, and you day by day fall in love with Him, and He becomes clearer and clearer to you who He is. Now listen, I can only say this to you because um, I bring you greetings from the DeBerry Orange City Church. Who we just elected all new leaders, and in doing that, we've done a fast, and it's a 40-day fast, and I'm on day 30, 33, so 40 days is coming, and I can't wait. But in fasting and praying, what God has shown me is the matchless charms of Jesus Christ. And that there is nothing, nothing that I have to offer and nothing that I have to give that does not come from Him. There is nothing that I can say that will touch anybody's heart 
unless it is spirit-driven and spirit-produced. Amen? 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 Amen. Amen. When you come here, what you come here for <coughs> is to have your batteries recharged so that when you leave here and go out into the world, you are on fire for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And that you are able to share Him with the people you come into contact with. Amen. Some of you are thinking, no, I am not a preacher. I can never share Jesus Christ with somebody else. I'm just not that type. But do you understand that how you act, how you talk, how you treat people, will say more than I can ever say as a pastor, a preacher, or a teacher. Amen? Amen. Okay, so. The pearl is worth everything. Paul understood this, and when Paul encountered Jesus Christ, he gave up everything to get this pearl. Interesting, that pearl, let's go back to uh, Matthew. 13, let's look at this. Let me ask you a question. Salvation, is it a free gift or do we have to purchase it? Well, you actually sounded pretty good then. So you're all in agreement, correct? Salvation is a free gift. Well, let's look at this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found the one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he what? He bought it. He purchased it. Right? Yeah. Is the Bible contradicting itself? Is salvation a free gift? No. I mean, Listen, salvation is a free gift. Amen. Now say it, Ray. To me. But it costs something. Amen. Listen, Amen. salvation is a free gift. There is nothing you're ever going to do to earn salvation. <coughs> but if you want the salvation, it will cost you everything. How would you like to be Paul? And when God said about Paul, Paul's going to learn great sufferings for my name's sake. Yeah. How would you like that to have to be, to be your, your Christian walk in life? Okay? Did Paul accept those sufferings gladly? Yes. Yes? Absolutely. Yes. On the last part of his ministry, he came to the brethren. <laughs> They kept telling him, if you go up to Jerusalem, this is the end of your ministry, the end of your life. There's nothing there waiting for you but chains and prison. What did Paul say? Paul said, brother, why do you break my heart? I will gladly give up my life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Was he boasting like Peter did when he told the Lord, I will die for you? No. All these will forsake you, but I will die for you. <coughs> Or did he mean what he said because he understood what conversion really is? That is no longer I, I almost fell off that. It's no longer I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And how does Galatians 2.20 go? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I am not yet I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Who wrote that? Paul. Paul. Do you understand? Paul was an example of what true conversion is. This is the pearl of great price. This is what God wants to do for you and me. Can I ask you one question as I bring this to a close? Why has Jesus Christ not come back yet? As I look at that clock up there, is there a great clock at God's throne and He's waiting for that hand to strike 12? No, no. Well, there's different views on that. Yes. There's different teachings on that. I've heard many. Christ hasn't come back because He's not ready to come back yet. When you look at the life and the experience of Paul, Paul was what God's <coughs> remnant last day people are going to be before Christ comes back. Paul was selfless. Paul understood what it meant when he said, I die yearly. Daily. Come on, man, I die monthly. Daily. No, no, I'll, I'll die weekly. Daily? Are you crazy? Listen, 
This is what Christ is calling us as his people to do. That when we understand that, that it is not about us, it is about him, and that if we submit to him, and if we die daily to him, and we have the mind of Christ in us, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. That was a mind that says, Ray, I love you so much that I'm willing to give my life for you. And that when we have that same mind,